heaven, I will be thy name, thy kingdom come. I will be thine on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus, our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory now and forever. Amen. All right. Um, we stopped last time at uh, the end of the institution, and we talked about the epiclesis when the, when the priest and, and the person of Christ pray to the Father for the descent of the Holy Spirit, our little Pentecost that happens on Sunday, every Sunday. And the priest is asking here for the Holy Spirit to come from the Father to, to, to descend on the bread and wine and also on the participants, on the, the, the congregation and himself. And to turn the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. So let's go back and look at this piece here. Uh therefore as we also commemorate so this is preparation for the epiclesis for the asking for the descent of the holy spirit his ascension into the heavens the, one of the most awesome peace right or place in the liturgy o father and his second coming from the heavens awesome and full of glory we offer unto you your gifts from what is yours for everything concerning every thing and in every thing. Worship God in and trembling. We praise you, we bless you, we serve you, we worship you. Remember, we said after the anamnesis, the remem remembrance of the Paschal mystery, which is Jesus' crucifixion, suffering, crucifixion, burial, death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and his second coming. We call those the Paschal mystery. And the, the, to share into them, to remember them, is to bring them back to our memory. Uh, that's called anamnesis, not to forget. As we are doing this, it is the best environment it's the best preparation for the request of the holy spirit because if you understand that the holy spirit the descent of the holy spirit happened immediately after jesus i mean within 10 days jesus ascension to the heaven so after he had finished uh, the suffering and the resurrection and the ascension the holy spirit came down so the same thing the church here is following the same order remembering the passion, resurrection, ascension of Christ and second coming is what we call anamnesis, is the best preparation for epiclesis. And epiclesis is just the prayer of the descent of the Holy Spirit. So what the priest says inaudibly when, while he was uh, kneeling and everybody else is kneeling is requesting from the Father the gift of the Holy Spirit. You see the deacons outside on their knees, the priest on his knees, we were all begging God the Father for the descent of the Holy Spirit, and we say, we ask you our, uh, I'm trying to just to, to um, download, let me just uh, maybe download the, uh, or, or uh, share, if I can. So, the epic is said in the English side, and we ask you, that's what the priest says, inaudibly, quietly, and we ask you, O oh Lord, we hear the priest in the congregation, O oh Lord our God, he speaks to the Father, we, your sinful and unworthy servants, Worship you by the pleasure of your goodness, that you are pleased 
to receive from us our praise and our thanksgiving, that your Holy Spirit may descend. And he points to himself with his hands and then to the oblations present before him. That's the bread and wine and says. So he, you saw here uh, the priest Abuna had pointed to his own head. And that includes his head and the rest of the, uh, the congregation. And then to the bread and wine. To descend upon us and upon these gifts set forth and purify them, change them them and manifest them as sanctification of your saints. And then the, the deacon would say, let us attend. Then he goes um, and, and uh, he would lift up his head and three times he would make a sign of the cross over the bread. And then uh, uh, he says, um, and this bread he makes into his holy body. He, so he speaks to the father. He, the first he, he makes is the Holy Spirit. His here belongs to Christ. So the Holy Spirit will make that bread into the body of Christ, based on the words of Christ. Meanwhile, the priest stretches forth his hands and bows his head to the Lord, saying, oh, Our Lord, God, and Savior, Jesus Christ, given for the remission of sins and eternal life to those who partake of him. Three times he also signed the cup, and he would say the same thing. And this cup also, the precious blood of his new covenant. Again, he says that the Holy Spirit, who had uh, form the, the, the humanity of Christ in St. Mary, he is going to be responsible for transforming the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. And the, the people share in all the movements by responding. Again, I believe it's a personal thing. Every one of us would say that. And then again would say, oh, our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ, given for the remission of sins and eternal life to those who partake of him. That's what Jesus said in John 6. Now, indeed, the bread has become the body of Christ and the wine, the blood of Christ. After this, the, sing, the signing of both of them shall be through them and by them. The priest will not make a sign of the cross over them again. And then uh, the, the congregation would respond, Amin, Amin, Amin. So I'll, I'll disengage from the leader and I will go back to the liturgy and see um, that happening in Okay, so I'm going to go back to this, and then we'll hear it again. His resurrection from the, the dead, Pascal mystery. his ascension into the heavens, That's how he begins is sitting at your right hand. O Father, and his second coming from the heavens, awesome and full of glory, we offer unto you your gifts from what is so this yours. This is the movement. For every As we remember, you offer and we ask to send your Holy Spirit. So as if we're offering the bread and wine with the memory of the suffering Christ, the risen Christ. Worship God in fear. And trust. Here is the priest saying that the pieces. Let him descend upon us and on this you. We serve you. We the praise of Anaphra is the background of the offering. We offer in memory. He's asking for the descent of the Holy Spirit. And then he's going to go and ask for the transformation. And this bread he makes into his holy body. I So the precious blood of his new covenant. Again, I believe. Oh, 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 oh. Our Lord God and Savior Jesus Christ. 
given for the remission of sins and eternal life to those who partake of Him. Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy, Lord have mercy. So the responses of the people are their sharing and their essential part in sharing in the liturgical uh, offering. When uh, when the priest rises up from this kneeling, he's actually now in the presence of the flesh and the blood of Christ. And in, in this, and from that now on, he's going to deal with it as such. So he will never sign up with his hand. Again, the bread and wine is no more a bread and wine. If he's going to, sh to sign it, he would use the bread, the, I'm sorry, the body to bless the blood, and he would use the blood to bless the body. And he will never, never use his hand again. He's un, you know, we don't feel worthy, of course, blessing Christ in our midst. So this is the presence of Jesus as he pre was present among his disciples in the upper room after his resurrection. He came while the doors were closed. This is the same thing here. Um, from now on, it's going to be litanies. Since we have Christ with us and Jesus asked us this, he asked anything in my name. We use his presence. Uh, we do this twice. We do it actually when we are reading the Gospels. It's the voice of the Lord. And now we, we use his presence in the body and blood to do the same. We ask from the Father multiple things. Let's go through them quickly. Mercy. Make us all worthy, O our Master, to partake of your holies unto the purification of our souls, bodies, and spirits, that we may become one body and one spirit, and may have a share and inheritance with all the saints who have pleased you since the beginning. Remember, O Lord, the peace of your one only holy Catholic and apostolic Catholic Church. here means universal. That's the Greek word for universal. Uh, church. So we're praying for the universal church. And that universal church includes every single believer. So we look around and we see, um, you know, Roman Catholic, um, of course, Orthodox first of all kinds of Orthodox ethnic groups, um, those who are in communion, those who are not in communion, all the Protestant world, because they are, we, we think of the Protestants as uh, someone who is not a Christian who is absent from the church. We, we want them to be with us, but they had long uh, for, for now, for six, seven centuries, they had been out of the church and, and we pray for them to be back reconciled. So we're thinking of the bigger church, the universal church with all its schisms, with all its divisions. It hurts, but we still pray for the whole universal church. Pray for the peace of the one holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. So that Catholic is not the Roman Catholic, it is the universal church. The one God. Lord have mercy. This which you have acquired to yourself with the precious blood of your Christ. Keep her in peace with all the Orthodox bishops who are in her. For most remember, O Lord, our blessed and honored Father, the Archbishop, our Patriarch, Abba Toedros II, and his spiritual brethren, the Patriarch of Antioch, Mar Ignatius Ephraim II, and the Patriarch of Eritrea, Abun Antonius I, and his partner in the Apostolic Liturgy, our Father, the Bishop. Abba Yusuf. Here, uh, we pray for all the Orthodox bishops. And Orthodox here means the people who believe in Christ as the Son of God. Like I, we talked about being Orthodox, the general term, the ancient term of Orthodox, someone who believes Jesus as equal to the Father, in, in, oppo in opposition to the Arians. So uh, all those shepherds, the bishops, of all the churches that we think as belonging to the one universal church, we pray for them. And we pray for all the leaders and the shepherds of the, of the Christians, especially those who take care of us personally. 
like our patriarch, the church of Syria, because we are in communion with them in the patriarch of Ethiopia and Eritrea. Lord, have mercy. And those who rightly handle the word of truth with him, grant them unto your holy church to shepherd your flock. In peace, remember, O Lord, the Orthodox Hegemon's priests and deacons. Pray for the Hegemon's priests, deacons, subdeacons, and the seven orders of the Church of God. Lord, have Those who help the bishop the and their, and their and ministries, that's the priest, the Hegemons are and the, the manager of the church, of all the priest who has the job of managing. Remember, and then maybe want to, want to talk about the seven orders. Mercy upon us all. Have mercy upon us, O God. This is the we call the litany of mercy, and the people here speaks to God the Father for the first time in the anaphora, and it's usually sung with the priest. Um, the priest had to be um, singing this with the with the people because it's addressing God the Father before the fraction. Uh, so um, this is something. Uh, that I have to mention. It's called the Litany of Mercy. Have mercy upon us, O God, the Father, the Pantocrator. And um, here the the uh, the address God the Father. Although the rest of the same basal liturgy and St. Gregory and St. Cyril, the congregation addresses Christ. This is the beginning. This is the first one. The second one will be our Father. Remember, O Lord, the salvation of this your holy place and every place and every monastery of our Orthodox Fathers. Pray for the salvation of the world and of this city of ours and of all cities, countries, islands and monasteries. Here it, that this is the places, especially the church and the city, the church in, and all the world, places one by one. And those who dwell therein in God's faith, graciously accord, O Lord, to bless the waters of the river this year. Pray for the rising of the waters of the rivers this year that Christ our God may bless them and raise them according to their measure, that he may give joy to the face of the earth, sustain us the children of men, save the cattle, and forgive us our sins. Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy, Lord, have mercy. Pray for the cattle and animals and everything, every creature. Sure. And his fruit be plentiful, preparing for prepare it for sowing and harvesting. Manage our life as deemed fit. Bless the crown of the year with your goodness for the sake of the poor of your people, the widow, the orphan, the traveler, the stranger, and for the sake of all of us who entreat you and seek your holy name. For the eyes of everyone wait upon you, for you give them their food in due season. Deal with us according to your goodness, O you who give food to all flesh. Fill our hearts with joy and gladness, that we too having sufficiency in everything always may abound in every good deed. Lord, have mercy. Next 
Franciscan liturgy is offering. Remember, O Lord, those who have brought to you these gifts, those on whose behalf they have been brought, and those by whom they have been brought. Give them all the heavenly reward. I don't think it's uh, the body and blood of Christ he's talking about right now. Because when we remember when we started, we said about the offerings that people bring in that big uh, sheet. It's here. If you can see my arrow, that piece of cloth, it's spot. It's here. Uh, because. Because this is where they had all the offerings of people. If they had grain, grapes, um, sometimes people bring other stuff to the church, some clothes, some uh, uh, sheets of linen or silk or something. They take it in this big piece of cloth and they put it on the altar so that the, the, this prayer is not actually about the body and blood because the body and blood is not our making. We didn't bring them. It is the work of the Holy Spirit. It's the work of God on the bread and wine. And so we, we no more think of the bread and wine because we had already offered them. God accepted them and gave us the bread. And the, the, instead of the bread, he gave us the body of his son. So when he says, uh, remember all those who have offered you these offerings, it is not actually the body and blood of Christ. It is the, the other offerings in the prosperity. It's something used to be here and no more. So this is a very ancient, very ancient very ancient um, uh, litany about the time when people used to be giving God and the church stuff and they will be put on the altar as well with the body and blood of Christ. So I want us to be clear that this litany of offering that becomes uh, became uh, confused with the offering of body and blood. It's not the same. For these holy and precious gifts, our sacrifices, and those who bring them. Lord, have mercy. This is preparing to the, the diptych or the remembrance of the saints who have left us and they are in paradise. As this, O Lord, is the command of your only begotten Son, that we share in the commemoration of your... Here somebody name. might ask, say, is, when did Jesus ask us to commemorate, to remember the saints who had... Um, perfected their faith. And the answer we had is that at one point, Jesus had a woman bringing a jar of alabaster uh, uh, with, filled with a very costly perfume. And she broke it and dumped it on his head. And he was covered with perfume in, his, in the Holy Week. So Jesus said, wherever the gospel is preached, let what this woman did be known. Let it be part of the gospel. So the disciples remember that Jesus actually asked them to remember the woman um, and all over the world and to tell everybody about what she had done. And this became the, the rule that Jesus wants us to remember those who have offered their lives, not just a costly perfume or money, but they offered their whole lives, like the martyrs, the apostles, the evangelists, those who had offered God their lives will be remembered and it will be remembered all the time. So uh, this is important, and, and, and it's, a, it's a very significant part. Not that they need our prayers, just that we have to remember them as Jesus commanded us. So that's, that's the, the commemoration of the saints. And since this is the case, we do also remember the, the people who had um, left us from our own families. Some people ask, why do you pray for the dead? It's not going to help them. It's, this is not actually the issue. We're not trying to help them or trying to uh, uh, change God's decision about them. It's actually remembering them, keeping them alive in our memory. And there's nothing better to keep them alive in the memory than the liturgy. As we remember Jesus' own suffering, we put all these saints and our families who had left us with him in that remembrance. 
So it's a big, huge remembrance that we do. We call, we recall everyone in starting from Jesus himself, and then we go through the, the other saints. And here, I'm going to just uh, get some glimpses of what that commemoration looks like. Gracious the accord, O Lord, to remember all the sins who have pleased you since the beginning. Our Holy Fathers, the patriarchs, the prophets, the apostles, the preachers, the evangelists, the martyrs, the confessors, and all the spirits of the righteous perfected in the faith. Most of all, the pure, full of glory, ever virgin, holy Theotokos, Saint Mary, who truly gave birth to God the Logos, and Saint John the Forerunner, Baptist and Martyr, Saint Stephen the Archdeacon and Proto-Martyr, the Beholder of God, the Evangelist, Mark the Holy Apostle and Martyr, the Patriarch Saint Severus, our Teacher Dioscorus, Saint Athanasius the Apostolic, Saint Peter the Holy Martyr and High Priest, Saint John Chrysostom, Saint Theodosius, Saint Theophilus, Saint Demetrius, Saint Cyril, Saint Basil, Saint Gregory the Theologian, Saint Gregory the Wonder Worker, Saint Gregory the Armenian, the 318 assemble at Nicaea, the 150 at Constantinople, and the two. I'm going to stop here and just uh, you know, it goes on with the list that you'll be familiar with when you read when you hear, when you attend the liturgy. And at the end of it, there will be a little space for those who have departed from our congregation, from the local congregation. I want to get fast forward to there. Elders of Shehid, the strong us, our Here is a litany. Here is a litany. My Lord, the Roman about Father, the patriarchs, Saint our patriarchs in St. Mark. Demetrius, and we're supposed to read the names of the, the patriarchs from St. Mark all the, the way of Quadros Arkham. I'm sorry, Bob Shunda, the last departed patriarch. So we're, we're, look, we're looking, may God keep Bob Quadros for many years. I'm talking about the departed patriarchs. So here is a litany. Our father, Abba Daniel, the hegemon, our father, Abba Isidore, the priest, our father of Abba the Kinonia, and Theodore his disciple, our father of Ashinuti the Archman Edrite, and Abba so, the deacon is going to call the readers to read the names of the patriarchs. And all the choir of your saints, through his prayers and supplications, have mercy on us all, and save us for the sake of your holy name, which is called upon us. So which names we pick? The list of saints and martyrs and apostles and evangelists and preachers is endless. So which names we pick? We The church picks the name, the names of those who had made a huge difference in our faith. They actually struggled for something that affects all the churches and we focus on those ones who had affected us in Egypt. So there's a great focus on that. So we go from the universal church, from the apostles, all the way to the saints of our own Coptic Orthodox Church. And this is basically what we remember. We pick the names that made the hugest differences in our faith. So basically, if you ask me why this name is not the endless list, because we cannot put the endless list. So we pick names that made a difference. So we have fathers of faith, struggling with faith, built up, uh, made anaphoras, uh, liturgies, uh, struggled to uh, keep the faith in Egypt, and also those who had established monastic life in Egypt. And by the way, monastic life established in Egypt actually started the monastic movement all over the world. So those are the names we keep. 
let's see what the deacon would say and that what what does that mean let those who read recite the names of our holy fathers the patriarchs who have fallen asleep O Lord ripples their souls and forgive us our sins. Here, I want just to stop and say, he's asking the readers, the, the agnosticists, the, the, the rank in the church that's responsible for reading the gospel and the letters and epistles and the, and the uh, liturgy of the catechumens. He's asking them to read the names of the, of the patriarchs. This is the list that we're looking at. Here it is. So the readers should somehow read the names and remember those names, starting from Mark, the St. Mark, the evangelist, Pope Inianus, and it goes down, uh, Milius, Cordonus, Ebrimus, Justus, Omanius, Marcianus, Claudianus, Agribinus, Iulianus, and goes on and on and on and on. I'm going to keep scrolling down. Of course, and I don't want to miss the, the 20th Pope, Pope Athanasius, the Apostolic. Um, so you go through that, that all the way down. I'm going to scroll down all the way to the last departed and uh, Pope. The 117 Pope Shenouda the third. The 118 is still alive, and God keep his life as Pope Tartus. So this is what we do. Then after that, um, the uh, the, de the deacons or the or the priests. I'm sorry, the the, the priests would ask for the co the congregation um, for the departed of the congregation. The priest is going to say, those, O oh Lord, whose souls you have taken, repose them in the paradise of joy. We're saying in the memory, we're saying a prayer more, more, more like uh, uh, a request of God to give them rest and to comfort them where they are. Uh, we don't say that this is going to change the place of someone from being in paradise to go to hell, to, uh, or from hell to heaven. That's not the case at all. It is actually actually a loving request of God in their memory that we wish, O oh Lord, that you, we can comfort them in that place that you have made for the saints. Saying those, O oh Lord, Lord, whose souls you have taken, repose them in the paradise of joy. The, the main reason for remembering forever, the departed the is the commemoration Jerusalem, to keep the memory alive amongst us. And we too who are sojourners in this place, keep us in your faith and grant us your peace. Now, this, the next part, the coming part is the last part of the liturgy, which is the... That all things your great and holy name may be glorified. Blessed and exalted in everything, honored and blessed with Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, and the Holy Spirit, be. You see here? Be with all. When he says that, usually the priest takes aside and let the body and blood of Christ greet or bless the congregation. That's what classically is done. So the priest says, Peace be with you. He does not sign the congregation with the sign of the cross as usual. In this moment, since the body and blood of Christ is available on the altar, he just goes to the side and exposes the body and blood to the congregation to have the body and blood give the peace, give the, the, the blessing. And with your Again, let us give thanks to God the Pontus. We make sure that in every 
the Father, the beginning our Lord, and at the end, God this is all about Thanksgiving before we get distracted Jesus into any other Christ, things. It's about Thanksgiving to the Father by the Son. That we have to say it again, again since we had said it before twice. To lift up our hands and to serve His holy name. Let us also ask Him to make us worthy of the communion and partaking of His divine and immortal mystery. something very special. Now it is the body and blood of Christ. He's going to lift the body up as an offering to the Father. Everybody's bound down and the priest is lifting up and say the holy body. Traditionally it should be left up actually all the way up. We worship your holy The lifting up is an offering of Christ, humanity to the Father. So I wish that the Abuna would have left that body with the fire up, up. Because everybody's kneeling to that offering. Everybody's waiting for that offering. And then he's bringing from the blood of the in the body, like we said. He'll make a kind of a prayer over it. Back, Christ, the coming back to the bottom. The Lord. And then the side. In the back, our in the back of the other side, complete the sign of the cross, which means, and this is important to understand that this moment in the liturgy, we're lifting up Christ to the Father. So what we are actually remembering and commemorating, it is the cross. When Jesus' humanity was lifted up on the cross to be offered to the Father as a victim of love on our behalf. So uh, there is one of the movements is that the priest lift up the, the body up and then bring it and sign it with the blood, remembering that the fraction was the breaking of the body of Christ before his father as an offering on our behalf. So we offer up our hearts in praise and we kneel down and, and we are at this awesome moment of offering the son to his father. Remember that this is, is done all in loving us all in loving us. So we give God thanksgiving. That's the whole point of the Eucharist. Then he starts breaking, and then you're going to see the sign of the cross is going to continue all the way to the end of the breaking. He takes one third, put it on the two thirds in the sign of the cross. And then he takes pieces and put it down in the pattern as a sign of the cross. Watch. that he's saying during the break-in is different from one season to another. There's one for the Lent, there is one for the Resurrection, there is one for Holy Saturday, Bright Saturday, when Jesus was buried. A beautiful one, my, my most favorite one is that uh, Bright Saturday fraction. And then the, there's one for the Resurrection, there's one for the 50 days, and then a special one for the Ascension and Pentecost, and there's a special one for the Fast of the Apostles. So different prayer for different seasons, but one action break in the holy body of Christ for our sake. Now we're gonna I'm gonna fast forward so that we get done with the prayer of the fraction. He's once he gets done the whole uh, bread is broken into a very special uh, way and then holy is the holy our Lord 
Amen. Amen. Alleluia. Now it comes to that. Father is in the heavens and the climax. I talked to you about this very holy moment of the epiclesis when, when the Holy Spirit descends and transforms the bread and wine. This one is a climax of the liturgy. Why do I say that? Because listen to that coming prayer. This is the climax of the Eucharistic liturgy in all traditions, in the six traditions that I told you about before. This is the climax of the liturgy, no question. Hey, our Father. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord, for thine is the kingdom, the power, now, and the glory Now, uh, the climax is our Father. We had not said the Our Father since the beginning of the Liturgy of the Faithful. And it is very fitting that you are going to say, Our Father, the congregation said it with the priest as one voice, with the body of Christ broken. This is very biblical, very gospel-like. When St. Mary Magdalene saw Jesus, the risen Lord, at the tomb, he told her, go tell my disciples or my brethren, I'm going to my father and their father, to my God and their God which means I am with them, but we're going to do this together. You are going to offer me to my father by offering me. He is your father too. So this is the very, the very exciting moment that we've been building up to, that we as a congregation with the priest address God as father by breaking the body of his son. This is the story of our salvation. Is completed by us meeting God, the Father, here on the liturgy. But eventually, as in Paul said it in the, his first Corinthian letter, um, chapter 15, he said, when, when, uh, when everything is done, uh, then the Son himself will offer us and submit to the Father so that, that God becomes all in all. So this is ultimately a representation, a, a short taste of what we are going to do in our salvation walk with Christ. So uh, this is our Father, and after that, what's left is added after the, the division of the church. And we are at this moment, the people are bound down. Outside and repenting for any sins, remembering their sins and repenting for it and asking forgiveness. Um, but then at the end, Amen. the holy, precious body and the true blood of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Again, signing the body with the blood. Oh, we have another question. Amen. Yeah. Uh, 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 so the uh, I know we spoke the other day kind of briefly. I, I was able to go and kind of get a tour of the of the Coptic church near me. Is there a certain difference to where you should go to a priest for a, uh, for repentance as opposed to doing it yourself directly to God? Is there is there a difference, or is that more in the beginning? Or is that oh, it's, a confusing question. It's not confusing. I think I think your uh, your question is very good, and I I would love to answer that, but I would want to go through this maybe as we are coming to uh, the baptism part. I'm going to start the baptism part by that by that question about why okay. do we have what 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 should happen when we go and have the whole process of repentance and the different terminology. What does repentance mean? What does confession mean? What is uh, what is the word reconciliation and to reconcile to God? So we're going to go through this. I'm going to use the parable of the prodigal son. I'm sure you're familiar with it. It's a very common parable. Yes. I'm going to use it and, and we'll use it and go through it and use other scriptures uh, to kind of go walk through this 
one step at a time and use the different uh, biblical uh, uh, terminology for it. Like what is repentance and what is uh, confession and where is the, what is the role of the priest in this and what are the sequence of things that should happen and according to Jesus' parable of the prodigal son. So we'll talk about that in details on, uh, if, you, if you wish and I can, I can uh, give you more more time and we focus on that as we're talking about baptism it's part of what we're going to talk about when we talk about baptism okay thank you very much you're very welcome so the last piece in the liturgy is the is the confession of the priest and the confession basically oh, was man. added when the church split over the nature of christ is he one nature two natures what is it actually that we are what do we mean so here you're going to find a, a very good answer to the Chalcedonians, those people who always, uh, especially the people that actually always kind of accuse us of being, uh, believing in one dimension Jesus, the divine Jesus. That's what they say. You're monophysites because you believe only in a divine Jesus, but you have no humanity. That's not the case. Here you're going to listen carefully and see that very short confession of the priest says it all and we answer with it. The body and the blood of Emmanuel our God, this is true, Amen. to the last breath that this is the life-giving flesh that your only begotten son our lord god and savior jesus christ took from our lady the lady of us all the holy theotokos saint mary he made it one with his divinity without mingling without confusion here he's referring the body and he's saying it is the one and same body that Jesus took from St. Mary. So he's, that's what St. John in the Gospel, in the Gospel of John, uh, chapter 6, had said, that they said, didn't we, isn't this the, the Jesus, the son of Mary and Joseph, we know his father and mother. So there is a reference to that, that it is true, he is the son of Mary, but he is not just the son of Mary. He is the divine person, the son of God. But he made his divinity, that, that, that divine nature that came from heaven, one with his humanity without mingling or I'm gonna let's just hear it again the three the three descriptions and they're very specific Jesus Christ took from our lady the lady of us all the holy Theotokos Saint Mary he made it one with his divinity without mingling, without confusion. Mingling, and confusion, alteration. alteration. So the divine and the human nature were united without mingling. What is mingling? It's like salt and pepper or salt and sugar. You still can taste sugar and you still can taste salt. Or you can still taste pepper and you can still taste uh salt it is not so this is we answer to say there was not a single time in jesus life on earth or now that, that you can point your finger and say this is human oh this is divine oh he raised the dead by his divine nature no he touched people and they were healed he touched them with his human finger but yet his human finger had the power to heal yes we know that his divinity and humanity was united but you cannot say which one is which. If they were totally in union. He made that humanity his. And the first thing is no mingling, like salt and, and, and sugar. So what about uh, without, what's the second one? Without mingling, without confusion. Confusion. 
um, confusion is when you take two liquids and mix them together. And uh, that, that confusion you don't know now, um, it's almost like a new, a new taste. So that, that there is an, a third nature came out, something strange. Like, let's say you put, uh, let's say uh, you put a soda and um, a soda on a soup, okay? So there's salty soup and the soda, and you get some kind of bubbling, and and then the 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 the, the result of the mixing of the two, the the confusion that happened, I'm um, sorry, the the mixing that happened is something different. It is not actually this or that. So what about the third one? How about alteration? Oh, when you mix chemicals together. When you mix chemicals together, if the, both the chemicals that you're mixing, if they are reactants, they change. They lose their characters. So what are we trying to say with, by the three terminologies? We know that Jesus, divinity, and humanity was united in a single person, but there was no uh, distinction you can make in the flesh that this is divine and this is human. He was the divine human. He was the two together in every action including suffering, including, we know that divine, divine nature does not suffer, but we cannot say Jesus' humanity suffered because you're actually picking and choosing. No, the divine Jesus suffered. So when, uh, when we, we talk about the second terminology, so that's called, uh, that's the first one, without mixing, without confusion, and without alteration, the confusion is when you have a third thing coming out of the two. It's not that, it's not this. And the, the alteration is the change. So the divinity did not get damned into human, nor the human was raised up to be divine. Otherwise, the human would not be able to suffer. And the divine will lose his, his power. No, none of that happened. So those three terminologies are very to talk about our belief. What are we saying then? We have distinct nature. We can actually experience in Christ the two, but without change, without this separating them from each other and say, oh, he suffered as a human, he, he did miracles like a divine. And without having to think of different nature that came out of the two. So this is basically what the priest is saying. And this is a very powerful answer. I had yet to see someone from the Chalcedonian family who would respond to this unfavorably. Then they will say, oh, so you believe like us? I say, well, yes, we do. It's all political, guys. You didn't realize that? Let me just... Do it. He confessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate. Yeah. He gave it up for us upon the Holy... I believe. Amen, amen, amen. I believe, I believe, I believe and confess to the last breath that this is the life-giving flesh that your only begotten Son, our Lord God and Savior, Jesus Christ, took from Our Lady, the Lady of us all, the Holy Theotokos, Saint Mary. He made it one with His divinity without mingling, without confusion, and without alteration. He confessed the good confession before Pontius Pilate. He gave it up for us upon the holy word of the cross. Of his own will for us all. Truly I believe that his divinity parted not from his humanity. For a single moment nor a twinkling of an eye. Given for us for salvation. Remission of sins and eternal life to those who partake of him. I believe, I believe, I believe that this is true. Amen. This is called the confession of the deacon. It is a request from the people, the people to pray for that word communion that everybody will be ready to take. And he is asking them to sing a praise for God. And this is what happens immediately. It's true. Now the congregation sings the praise. Amen. Pray for us and for all Christians who said to us concerning them. He's asking for people to remember those who asked us to remember them in the house of the Lord. 
in the house of the Lord. The peace and love of Jesus Christ be with you. Sing Alleluia. Pray for the worthy partaking of the immaculate, heavenly, and holy mysteries. Lord, so the congregation start praising the, the final praise, which is another piece. Uh, this follows the same theme, and I didn't speak about that much. The same, the same um, steps of the Passover, Passover uh, Seder, the, the rite of the Passover, the Jewish Passover. So they end the Passover by the praise and you notice this actually in the gospel especially the uh, gospel of saint luke maybe when they sung a praise after the passover after the meal was done and then jesus took them and went to gethsemane so that praise sung at the end is a very traditional passover step it is excitement about god's promises that by taking communion as we are taking communion we're thinking that god's promises are all true he has enabled us to eat of the or he's he's in enabling us to eat of the body and blood of his son and and so we're given the foretaste of heaven that is the promise that god has given us so uh, this gets gets us very excited and we sing the psalm 150. psalm 150 also is the last psalm in the hebrew version and its conclusion praising god uh, as a conclusion of all the praises it's very important to understand and Psalm 150 is actually uh, the conclusion of the Hebrew praises in the old times. And it's the conclusion of the church praises too, as we end in the liturgy um, of the Eucharist. So Psalm 1 and 2 is an introduction. Psalm 150 is the conclusion of all the Psalms. And by this, uh, when, when the people take communion, last comment, remember how the priest offered the body and blood of Christ to the Father. Now it is brought to us to commune and to share the body of Christ. It's, so we, we share the body between as an offering to the Father and us. So that's a communal sacrifice, something we share. This is not just a, a, a sin offering, which it is. It's also a communal offering that we share in it, like a peace offering. So this ends uh, the, the, our talk about the liturgy of the faithful. Um, I'm just to remind you of what we've been doing and what we will do. We started by talking about the history of the church and where we come from. And we uh, went through the Gospel of St. John, Chapter 6, as introduction to the Eucharist, the, the, the liturgy of the Eucharist. And then we talked about the reality of the body and blood of Christ amongst us and something we believe before even the 5th century and we have in common with the rest of the Orthodox and the Catholics before even the Christians were divided. And then uh, we went through the fathers of the church, including Justin Martyr and, uh, um, and the liturgy, and uh, I'm sorry, the uh, constitution of the apostles from the second century. And then we went through the liturgy of the faithful, where we looked at the uh, prayers and uh, the structure of the liturgy. Uh, if, and I asked you to remember to read uh, chapter 4 and 5 as the praise in heaven, as the model the church took for the liturgical praise, anaphora, Revelation 4 and 5. And then uh, we concluded today the liturgy of the faithful. Now, what we need to do next is the seasons of the church. It might not take a whole session, but we'll do the seasons of the church and start the rite of baptism, which I'm not planning to take more than one or maximum two. And when we finish the rite of baptism, I think uh, you're ready to make your um, your introduction to the church and to think about baptism. Um, if you have, we have anything else to do, would be um, something that would answer a question. So, if for the baptism, I think it would go uh, starting with the, the confession and repentance. We'll talk about that next time after we do a brief talk about the seasons of the church, and that's I think what I have. God be with you and support you. Our Father, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. 
Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. In Christ Jesus our Lord. Thine is the kingdom, power and glory now and forever. Amen. May the love of God the Father and grace is only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you. Peace be with you.